Number 10, the Anguish Man. I don't care who you are, but every family out there has one artifact or one heirloom in their house that just doesn't sit well with you. Please comment below and let us know. I'm, I'm actually very curious to see what it is. For me, it was a dancing Halloween skull with moss and black roses coming out of its eyes, playing the classic funeral song. I don't know what you call it, but you know what I'm talking about. Speaking of funerals, that's probably where the Anguish Man came from. I'm just taking a guess. The Anguish Man is a painting of a man in anguish, or some sort of distress, and I'm not just saying this to be funny, but the painting is 100% bona fide scary. What's more unusual than that is that no one is sure of its origin or creator. The current owner of the painting says he got it from his grandmother, and the knowledge train stops there. No one knows where it came from. But seriously, look at it. It's scary. It's terrifying. I don't like it. I'm gonna walk off now. I'm scared. Number 9, the Goddess of Death Statue. Well, that's quite the name. Okay, let's talk about it, shall we? For starters, it doesn't look like anything menacing, which makes the tail that much more convincing, if anything. It looks like one of those crazy bones. Remember crazy bones from the late 90s? So good, I had all of them. Put them in my mouth all the time, weirdly. It's like the suck on some crazy bones. This cursed ancient statue from 3500 BC was unearthed at Lempa, Cyprus back in 1878. The limestone was dated quite a while back, and the statue, as far as origins go, is a complete mystery. But many historians believe that it was once a fertility statue, or it represented a goddess whose name has now been lost in time. The statue has gone through numerous families, with tragedy following closely behind. Hence the, you know, curse aspect of his list. Lord Elephant had the statue for around six years, and during that time, all seven of his family members bit the bullet. Second owner, Ivor Minucci, same thing, entire family just wiped out, this time only within four years. Lord Thompson Noel, entire family, also four years. And then finally, the statue had belonged to the late Sir Alan Biverbrook and his family. And you can probably guess what happened within a few years. Number 8, Cursed Amethyst. A beautiful purple amethyst stolen from India, worth a fortune and would make an excellent addition to any jewelry collection. Trouble is, there may be something wrong with this gorgeous gem. Cursed, that is. The first gentleman to appropriate this gem quickly became ill afterwards and passed away. The gem was then given to his son, who also became ill and croaked. The gem kept passing hands as the story goes on, until it came to the possession of a man named Edward Heron Allen, who was so convinced of the gem's dark powers, he stored it in a bank vault and put it in seven lockboxes, just to make sure. It's kind of like the babushka doll from hell. He also left strict instructions to take out the gem 33 years exactly to the day that he put it in, and a warning for anyone who dares possess such an item. It now sits in the Museum of Natural History. I'll keep my distance, thank you very much. Number seven, the baker's wedding dress. Why is it in so many horror films the ghost is always a lady floating around in a white wedding dress? Mix it up a little, I don't know. Maybe a bridesmaid's gown wouldn't hurt. Maybe something red, some little pizzazz on it, I don't know. Been watching a lot of RuPaul's Drag Race. Throw, a, throw, throw some glitter on something, I don't know. They're always taken out before their wedding night, it seems. Or apparently they're taken out over a vase. Back in 1849 in the small town of Atuna, Pennsylvania, Elliot Baker and his wife Hetty lived in the Baker Mansion. They had two sons, one daughter, and a baker. Anna had fallen in love with one of her father's employees, another steel worker, but her father wouldn't allow the relationship to really, you know, take off. Anna vowed to never marry again, and she locked herself in her room. When her father passed away in 1848, she went to go find her true love, but he had since settled down. So she spent the rest of her days behaving erratically. You know, she was upset, rightfully so. Her father didn't let her have her true love. And now her soul still haunts that same wedding dress today. Not just the dress too, the mansion is haunted as well. And guests would report furniture and vases moving around all the time. That's not bad as far as hauntings go. If you ask me, moving couches? That'd be great. I have a bad back. I would love some help. Really, thank you. Anna, grab the side. Let's go. One, two, three. Number six, the crying boy. Another painting, I know, but this one is extra creepy. So basically, there's this very popular print of a painting. It's a boy, he's crying. Oh, I know, who would want that though, seriously. There's different versions of it, but originally done by Bruno Armilio. Well, we don't talk about Bruno because his painting had some serious creep factor going on. Besides the fact that it's a crying young man who's peering into the very depths of your soul, firefighters began to notice a pattern when putting out house fires. There's a connection here, hold on, stay tuned. No smoke alarms, leaving the stove unattended, and this painting were common. I wonder why. Except the painting was never damaged in any of these fires. And after putting out a few houses, and the same painting keeps showing up and keeps surviving the said fires, that's strange. Hmm, that's weird. As it turns out, the print had flame retardant chemicals in its production, thus protecting it. Maybe just don't bring it inside though. Number five. The Hope Diamond. Coming from the 1660s, this curse began when a gem dealer named Jean-Baptiste Tavernier 
bought this large diamond when visiting India. He bought it with his, with his earned money, with his money, okay? Remember that. The origins of the diamond were unknown, but it didn't matter. This beauty was just sitting there and he had to throw all the cash at it. He had to buy it with all of his money. For sure, the money that he had. Well, later on, after Tavernier got the diamond, rumors spread throughout Europe and the United States that he actually stole the diamond from the statue of a Hindu goddess. He didn't actually buy it. Yeah, little different than his story. Sadly, more believable too. The newspapers actually kicked this one off by publishing the Hope Diamond as an ancient curse. The diamond at one point ended up in the hands of King Louis XVI and his wife, Marie Antoinette. Well, if you don't know about them, they were, uh, they lost their, you know, they died. They lost their lives during the French Revolution, let's just say that. The old guillotine dream team. The stone then went to Lord Francis Hope come 1839. By that point, it was deemed cursed for real, hence the Hope Diamond name. They ended up selling the diamond shortly after being reduced to poverty, and then Evelyn Walsh McLean bought the stone in 1912. Shortly after, her son was killed in a car accident, and when the stone was delivered to its final and current home, the Smithsonian, back in 1958, the driver delivering the package was later hit by a truck. He survived, but shortly after this, his house caught fire. Moral of the story, you don't need diamonds for more reasons than one. Number four, crude oil. Before anyone jumps all over me and says, but Chetty, I love crude oil because it provides jobs and economy. That's true, you're right, and there's probably gonna be someone else saying that without crude oil and gasoline, how can they keep up their lifestyle? I need gas for my sedan, pickup truck, SUV, RV, dirt bike, quad bike, go-kart, speedboat, my John Deere, lawn equipment. All this is true, and as a big dude, I appreciate the automobile just as much as the next guy. I ain't walking. However, one cannot deny the amount of trouble oil has caused folks in the last 100 years. Name a place with oil and there's probably someone foaming at the mouth trying to get their hands on it. You can go either way on this one, really. All I know is that I'm not the emperor of an evil empire looking for oil. Or am I? Number three, the Busby Stoop Chair. The Busby Stoop Chair comes from 1702. So right off the bat, this legend kicked off only 10 years after the Salem Witch Trials. So take this one with a grain of salt, please. People made odd choices at this time. They kind of believed anything, you know, women were witches, chairs were haunted. Welcome to 1702, I guess. Englishman Thomas Busby had some issues with his father-in-law. He didn't handle those issues well and he had to be hanged for it. Yeah, you can't just kill people for no reason, Thomas. What is it, 1701? That's crazy. He was hanged near the Humble Inn, ironic name, but a chair that was nearby during said hanging is now said to hold the spirit of one Thomas Busby. So legend has it, if you sit on this chair or you put your knee on it or whatever, you are set to die in a frightful accident. A frightful accident! Big chair, could you imagine? You sat in that chair, now you're gonna your pants at work. No! <laughs> That's it. God forbid you needed to tie your shoelace at the Humble Inn. Oh, uh, the horrors! The horrors. So the chair was declared haunted. The chair was declared haunted. But did anything actually happen afterwards? Yeah, honestly. Sounds silly, but this was the real deal, I guess. Locals say during World War II, airmen from a nearby base came to the pub and those who sat in the Busby chair have never returned. Again, could have had something to do with the war, but let's continue. Then in the late 70s, more accidents were connected, but they still kept the chair around until 1798. They're like, eh, it's haunted, but it looks nice, you know? It matches the wall. It stayed at the inn for that long, and then it was donated to the Thirst Museum. So if you feel like checking out some haunted chairs, there you go, freaks. Number two, Capuchin Crypt. Hey, I get it. In the past, there were no home renovators. You couldn't walk into your favorite big box home renovation store and pick out some great additions for interior design. Well, some guys in Rome thought their church was a little underwhelming. They wanted something that made a statement, something bold, something macabre. The Church of Santa Maria in Rome, and it has a longer name, but it's not dyslexia friendly, so I'm not gonna pronounce it, is a church that's decorated with skulls and bones arranged in tasteful art pieces, lining the walls and archways with bones look like designs, and one room having some mummified monks and a wall full of skulls to comfort, Churchgoers, oh god. I can just imagine what a room full of old bones smells like. Oh, no thank you. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be sick. Oh. And number one, the Great Bed of Ware. Yeah, let's get nice and cozy for this last one. When putting this list together, Big Chet and I both agreed that Haunted or Not, this is a bed we would both have, for sure. It's massive, it's cozy, it caught our eye. It looks like a bed a king would sleep in, and rightfully so. The Great Bed of Ware was built for the royal family back in 1463. It was 12 feet by 12 feet. Plenty of space to cut your toenails, whatever you want to do. Yeah, just brush them off. You got like 11 more feet to work with. You're good. It's a big bed. What a time. Jonas Fosbrook, a carpenter from the time, impressed King Edward IV with his work. The king gave him a pension for life all because of this bed. That's how good it was. Over time, the bed became property of the Lord of Ware Manor, a man named Thomas Fanshawe. People would travel all across the land to see this beauty. That's a fun family vacation. Hey, let's go see this bed. I heard it's a neat bed. Pack your stuff. 
Shakespeare mentioned it in the Twelfth Night, it was a big deal, but all those who stayed in the bed did not have a good night's rest. Rather, they woke up to scratches and bruises, it was horrible. That is, if they got enough sleep to begin with. People would wake up on the floor. Somehow they would roll out of a 12 foot bed. That's crazy. Today it can be found in the Victoria and Albert Museum, so if you want to go cuddle up, there you go. Picking off the list at number 10, the Ring of Secundianus. One ring to rule them all. And by rule, I mean curse you and your entire family for ages to come. Yeah, this 12 gram gold ring for starters was massive. It was beautiful. Its diameter was 25 millimeters. So unless you were wearing some mighty gauntlet, she might slip off. Big old ring. It's like a big onion ring, but a little bit, a little bit more haunting. The ring had first been found in 1785. A farmer was plowing a field in Silchester Village, which is a village west of London, known for its, you know, grim history, as are most of these things on this list. In 45 AD, ancient Romans invaded that site, and come the seventh century, it was completely abandoned. No one was left there. The ring was mighty. It had an inscription on it as well, a Latin inscription. Of course, always Latin. It read, Senecion vivas in diem. When 1929 rolled around, new details surfaced, or resurfaced, rather. The day data from the ring matched an excavation that was done in the early 1900s, less than 100 miles away, a place called Lindney. That's where this ring is from. That's the OG. That's the OG site. At the same site, however, a tablet was found recalling the Celtic god of healing and hunting and how his favorite gold ring was stolen. In case you're wondering why this rings a bell, Lord of the Rings was inspired by this legend. The tablet also says, may he who bears the name of Senechianus not have health until he brings the ring back to the Temple of Nodens. So, if you've got it, Let's go. Number nine, the Crystal Skull. Honestly, I'm surprised we haven't talked about this more. A lot of Mesoamerican stuff today, but damn, they got a lot of curses and jinxes on all their stuff. And in reality, that's not fair. All a guy wants to do is loot and pillage other civilizations treasures, just like my ancestors before me. Nice. Maybe. Well, besides being the second worst Indiana Jones movie, yeah, I said it, I like that one better than the Temple of Doom. Now, if you didn't sit through an hour of Shia LaBeouf, and honestly, I don't blame you, basically the skulls are like a Pokemon or Dragon Balls. You gotta, you gotta catch them all. Only then, you will receive a wish where a ghostly outworldish creature will grant you said wish. In other words, this is what a weekend at Vanessa's Hudgens house looks like. I don't know, she said she can talk to ghosts, so. The only ghouls that she's talking to are the people who think High School Musical holds up as a theatrical release. Seriously, try watching that movie now without cringing yourself into the bottom of a liquor bottle. Speaking of ghosts and liquor, you can buy alcohol in the shape of a crystal skull, because we are modern humans and we don't take ancient warnings very seriously. We will probably feel the wrath of the crystal skull, all thanks to a Canadian Ghostbuster. Number eight, Pompeii artifacts. Once a thriving, beautiful city in ancient Rome, Pompeii was sadly destroyed in 79 AD. This time, it wasn't humans responsible for the massive loss of life. What do you know? It was actually Mother Nature this time around. Hmm, she got one. Nice. The eruption of Vesuvius buried the ancient city in volcanic ash. Thank you, it took nine tries. Little do you know, viewer. Excavation didn't begin until much later, during the 18th century, and after a century of careful excavations, the city was finally reopened again to the public. Finally, yeah. Just the place you want to go, eh? Every year there's many reports of lootings, locals, tourists, you name it. Everyone wants to steal a little piece of Pompeii. Literally, a little mm, just in their pocket. Yeah, as if raining volcanic ash wasn't bad enough, now there's thousands of people literally stealing your land. Piece by piece. Pompeii archaeological superintendents get over 100 packages a year of said stolen fragments. They return them. Yeah, thieves will send the artifact back with a little note explaining how sorry they are and how it's caused extreme bad luck in the household. Again, might have something to do with the fact that you're a thief, but hey, who knows? <laughs> Maybe it's that one time. That's why your marriage failed. Number seven, the pharaohs of Egypt. It was said that any thieves who dare enter or disturb the slumber of the deceased king shall be cursed and perish. Well, this applies to archaeologists too, unfortunately. Howard Carter, the famed archaeologist, and his team back in the 1920s had come across the discovery of a lifetime finding the tomb of King Tutankhamun. You probably heard of him. And kickstarting the study of Egyptology. For anyone in the sciences out there, you know how exciting this is. Trouble is, some folks on Howard Carter's team started to feel a little under the weather. Maybe it was all the excitement from their discovery. Maybe it was the hot African sun and the dry desert, or maybe it was the curse of the Egyptian pharaohs. As some men on his team perished from blood diseases, that's just not okay. So what's the lesson here? Maybe leave these places alone before it starts raining frogs? Huh? Think about it. I don't want that. Number six, the Koh-i-Noor diamond. Another list, another cursed diamond. Here we go, buckle up. 
The Kohinoor diamond translates to Mountain of Light in Persian, which sounds beautiful, but all that glitters is not gold. A Hindu legend says those who wear the diamond will own the world, but will also know all its misfortunes. 186 carats, this thing was a pure beauty. Of course, it was passed ruler to ruler, century after century at that point. The earliest account actually is 1628. The diamond was first in the possession of Mughal ruler Shah Jahan. But once his own son had him imprisoned, the diamond later went to Iranian ruler come 1739. Nadir Shah invaded, taking countless lives, as well as the Koh-i-Noor diamond, all their jewels for that matter, not just the one. It was horrible, but later on, he was taken out by 15 of his own officers while he was asleep. Come the 18th century, Queen Victoria had possession of the diamond after being used in the Treaty of Lahore, but Queen Victoria wasn't a fan of the shape. Yeah, she's like, eh, it doesn't really fit with my gauntlet to snap people away. So she had it recut. So now it's only 105 carats, it's a little smaller, but it's still beautiful. Since then, the diamond has only been worn by British royal women or else we'll explode. Number five, Nazca Lines. Imagine the confusion the first pilots, airmen, or anyone who got a good vantage point in the Peruvian desert, and to their surprise, discover some illustrations in the ground. Except, you know, they're, they're massive and no one knows who the heck drew them. Or at least its origins. Obviously it was done by some sort of ancient tribe or civilization, sure, but the grade school process of thought is an answer. And if you remember, then you remember. You know what I'm talking about. Your, your five W's. Your who, what, where, when, why, and sometimes how. I almost forgot how to count there. That dyslexia is a heck of a thing. I mean, I know how they dug these bad boys in the sand, but hear me out. In those times, there's no planes. The only way you'd be able to see them is on the surrounding foothills. But there's no evidence that these people live close to those drawings, so who were they made for? Gods? Extraterrestrials? The weird guy with the weird hair on the History Channel would tell you so. All I'm gonna say is, anything that's meant for gods and aliens, they meant for us. So keep, keep an eye out in space there. Keep an eye out. Number four, Ballista Balls. I'm not sure if you picked this up yet, but uh, don't take things that don't belong to you. Great, hit the, hit the thumbs up for that common knowledge we should all have. Whether you believe in curses or not, leave things alone, and people for that matter, okay? If you want to learn more about Roman artillery, that's why we're here. Don't steal 6th century weaponry, ever. It's a bad idea. Back in 1989, an archaeological team was brushing up the past near Israeli-Syrian borders, and the remains of an ancient Roman ballista, a massive crossbow, were found. It's exciting, but here comes the bad stuff. Six years later, researchers found ballista balls, which were sadly the ammo when it came to these massive war machines. And in 2015, these balls appeared in a courtyard outside of a museum in Israel, written from an anonymous thief, imploring others to never touch those stone balls or take them. As you know, they're, they're cursed. They're all cursed, apparently, full of bad luck. His family apparently left him, this thief, and he had to sell everything he possessed in order to just get by including those ballista balls. He was gonna sell them and he's like, you know what, no, that's the last thing I own, I'm putting it back. Could be a curse, again, or the fact that he was the thief. Either or, both not great. Number three, Montezuma's Revenge. Yes, that's right, Montezuma's Revenge, a traveler's worst nightmare. I too have succumbed to the horrors of Montezuma's Revenge. And it's always when I gotta do something important, like on a movie set, or with a group of people I'm really trying to impress, especially career-wise. So the rule is, no pickled vodkachini peppers before a critical event. However, I'm talking about a different kind of Montezuma's revenge, not the bathroom kind. I'm talking about his gold. I'm talking about when Hernan Cortez and the Conquistadors destroyed the Aztec Empire. Montezuma cursed them. And that applies to his lost gold as well. Which in case you didn't know, the Spanish were after. It's pretty much all they were after. So if Montezuma can curse your family trip to Cancun, then surely he can curse a pile of his own gold and jewels. After some were dumped in the lake and others in the desert, I just wouldn't exactly be so excited to go find it. You don't know what, I'm, what might happen if you do. If he can give you diarrhea, maybe he can give you vomiting. You don't know. You don't know. I'm pointing a lot in this video. And number two, ancient mirror. It doesn't matter who you are, you've heard of this curse before. Maybe you have it. Maybe you're experiencing this curse right now, I hope not. You break a mirror and what do you get? You get seven years of bad luck. Has this happened to you ever? If so, what year are you on? I'm on four myself. How close are you to the seven year mark? Cause we got your back, okay? Ancient Romans believed that the human soul would renew every seven years. That's where the seven year thing comes into play. It's where it all started. It takes time to repair the human soul, right? Combined with the belief that mirror's reflection was the only way into the soul, well, now we have one dude in history who feels really bad for breaking the first ever mirror. Therefore, a curse has lived on. If you break a mirror, you're tearing the soul from the body and now you're abandoning it. In Kazakhstan, if you break a mirror, evil spirits will 
will haunt the person responsible for the damage. That's a pretty horrible deal. They say you can't look into a broken mirror afterwards, like once it shatters into a bunch of pieces, because that's bad luck as well. So if you break a mirror, you just gotta do nothing about it, I guess. You just gotta be like, Ah, okay, and sweep without looking. There's too many mirrors now, I can like, cut to today. I'm sure ancient Romans had no idea what 2022 would look like. We have phone cases with mirrors on them. We're literally surrounded by mirrors. I broke a studio mirror, a dance studio mirror once. Am I doomed? I feel like I'm doomed. Number one, vampire burial. If you couldn't tell, I get a lot of my knowledge from movies, TV, and video games. It's just what raised me, that's how it goes. So you can't blame me when my knowledge of vampires comes from Skyrim and the hit young adult romance novels Twilight. You know what I'm saying? However, what I do know is that they have sharp teeth, they don't like garlic, and will cease to exist if you drive a wooden stake through their heart. However, that's kind of a moot point, as most things would not work anymore if you did that. I know I wouldn't. Some folks in Poland a few hundred years ago were not taking any chances, however. Remains found in Caldus, Poland, were that of anti-vampire graves. Basically, you bury the vampires and you leave a wooden stake in their heart just in case it wants to wake up and eat you or do whatever they do at night. I don't know, blah, 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 some of that stuff. Or remove their head entirely. No wooden stake, no problem. Just toss a couple small boulders into the hole. That way, the bloodthirsty menace can't get people. You know, boy, people in the past were so kind. That's so nice. 